Erwin Kumar, sir. What is that? Mm, yes. Yeah. yeah. I, I am here. Ma yes. Mamda, madam. Yes, I am here. Yeah. Uh, shall we start, madam? Yeah, yeah. Uh, we can start. Almost three thirty, I suppose. Yes. Okay. So let me. Uh, there is a formal welcome. Then there is an introduction by uh, Mamda Sahu. Then then we will proceed to the keynote address. So let me officially do my duty. So uh, it is a great privilege and an honor that we have a very reputed speaker uh, who is a professor in quantum information and computation group at uh, Harish Sundar Research Institute, Allahabad. And Arun Kumar Padisar is a very close friend of our faculty member, Mabda Sahu. And uh, I had uh, had a telephonic conversation with uh, A.K. Padisar and uh, I felt that he is a very wonderful person to be uh, in contact with. So I, first of all, find this opportunity uh, as a very uh, important opportunity for the Department of Physics. And also, I uh, welcome uh, A.K. Padisar on behalf of the Department of Physics to this gathering. Welcome, sir. And I also welcome all the faculty members, especially Professor Onigil mm -hmm. sir is here, and also Balram Rao sir is here. And I find it very uh, prestigious day that we have um, many faculties who are from our department itself is joining in our uh, webinar. And I welcome all the uh, senior faculty members to this uh, program, as well as there are many research scholars, faculty members, scientists in this group who are attending this program. So I welcome, uh, as a formal welcome, I give to all the participants in this webinar. I hand over the session to Mamda Sahu to formally introduce the speaker. Over to you, Mamda, madam. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Sivi. A very good afternoon to all. It gives me an immense pleasure to introduce the distinguished speaker and an eminent scientist, Professor Arun Kumar Pati. On behalf of the Department of Physics, University of Kerala. I thank Professor Pati for accepting our invitation and willing to be a part of this webinar series conducted for the Golden Jubilee celebration of our department. Professor Pati is a professor at the Harishandra Research Institute, Allahabad. He has been working on the areas of quantum information and quantum computation over the last 30 years. He is also well known worldwide for his significant contributions in these areas. He has edited two books. His research papers have been mainly featured in top journals like Nature, Science, and Nature Asia. His pioneering contributions in quantum information are the no deletion theorem, remote state preparation, no hiding theorem, and the stronger uncertainty relation in quantum mechanics which is beyond Heisenberg's picture. For his original and the creative contributions, he has received the Indian Physical Society Award for Young Scientists in the year 1996, Indian Physics Association Award for Young Physicists for the year 2000, and the Samant Chandrasekhar Award for the year 2009 from the Orissa Began Academy of Science India, he is a fellow of Indian Academy of Science, Bangalore, and a fellow of National Academy of Science, Allahabad. He received the Jesse Bos National Fellowship Award from the Department of Science and Technology, India, in the year 2019. He ranks in top 1% scientist in the world in general physics, and in top 2% scientist in, uh, in the world from all branches of science. So with this short introduction, I would request Professor Pati to deliver the talk. So, sir, please start your talk. Okay, thank you, Dr. Shivi and Dr. Sahu, uh, for inviting uh, to this auspicious event of uh, you know celebrating 50th anniversary of your university. So this is a great pleasure to be, you know, to uh, deliver a talk on this uh, occasion. Uh, so. So let me start uh, sharing my slide. Uh, 
Yeah, can you see my slide now? No, sir. It's not coming. Yes, no? it's coming now. Yes, it is visible. Yes, it is visible. So let me try to make it uh, full screen. Uh, okay, can you see now? Yes, it's visible now, but you can make it the uh, full. Is it full screen? Can you see full screen now? Yes, sir, we can see it, uh, but you can make it in the full slide mode. Oh, yeah, yeah, I made it full screen, but uh, are you able to see that? Did you see full screen? Yes. Full screen, is it full we screen don't or still? Uh, full, full screen is uh, still not uh, coming in our screen, sir. Uh -huh. uh, but I think uh, the we slides are visible, it. the quantum information technology, everything is visible. Presentation mode. Presentation. Yeah, I did. I did that slide show. Can you see now? No, sir. It's not coming. No. Uh, is it a, a MacBook, sir? Mac. It, it is it yeah, Mac, yes. Let me try again. Yeah. No. Let me try again one more time. So. It could be due to internet issue, so do you see? No. I you can see yeah. the slides. We can see, you can proceed, I think. We, we can, can proceed, sir. It is okay. We can yeah. we can see that just uh, uh, the full screen mode is not uh, uh, coming up. That is all. We can see. Uh, it is okay, sir. I think it is very visible also. Can you see now? Can you no, see sir, now? It's not. I think we can clean it up. But the full screen mode is not coming. There is some issue with the internet, I think. Even I. When I open the Google Meet, I don't see my screen anymore. You know, so I think something strange. So. Okay. Can you see now? Yes, sir. We can see now. The, maybe because it is a MacBook, uh, that, uh, probably the full screen is not supported, I suppose. Uh, now you can see full screen? No. Full screen doesn't uh, work, I think, sir. That, that is okay with us. Uh, no. Okay, so let me. Okay. This is visible for to all. Okay, so uh, so there is some issue. From the slide, yes, we can. It is visible. Yeah. Now this mode is visible. Yeah. Mamta madam, Mamta madam, is it okay? Is it okay? Yes. Yeah, yeah, it's it's okay. When I say slide, so it's not Mamta doing anything. Madam. So is it okay? Do do you see now? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. There is. Uh, we can see the slides, sir. You can see. Can you see now? Yeah, we can see the slides, sir. Okay, so now we will continue with this. Um, okay, so as you see, uh, the title uh, of this uh, talk is about uh, quantum information technology, and. Uh, 
what i want to do uh, is i will give an overview of this uh, exciting field uh, about quantum computing quantum information technology that is there already for last 30 years uh, but over last 5 years uh, you might have seen in several newspapers you know or several articles that uh, uh, you know government agencies private companies and industries you know they are taking deep interest in this uh, field of quantum computing and uh, there is already a global race in trying to build quantum computers. So why this is so exciting, why this is so interesting, and uh, what is the ultimate goal of this uh, quantum technology? So I will try to give an uh, you know, overall idea about this topic. OK, so, uh, so the plan of my today's talk is uh, a brief introduction to quantum computing. I will talk about uh, also quantum communication, quantum cryptography, quantum in general, quantum information technology and what is the future of this quantum technology. Uh, so, as all of we know, uh, we live in an era where all the time we are engaged in, you know, in some mobile or laptop or you know, desktop, and all the devices essentially they use classical information. And when you think of classical information, essentially your file or your information is stored in strings of zeros and ones. And basic unit of information in classical world is essentially a single bit which you denote a zero or one. So as I said, present the computers and in fact other information processing devices that you can uh, anything you can think of, they store information on, on transistors switching between on and off state. And any two distinct state you can refer to zero or one and that represent two possible state of a classical bit. And then what you do, you perform various tasks according to classical laws of physics. When I say classical laws of physics, I mean it can be Newton's law, it can be Maxwell's equation, it can be Hamilton's Jacob equation, anything you can think of. So essentially they will be classical physics. And what is uh, uh, the drastic difference between classical information and quantum information is in classical world, you never find a classical bit in combination of these logical state. That is, you will never find a switch which is both on and off, or you will never find a classical bit which is which is in a, a state of both zero and one. Okay. So when you think of computation in simplest terms, essentially it is a device and you have an input which is a string of bits, and device processes the information and gives some output which could be again a string of classical bits and essentially this is input you process it and you get some output so whether you think of a desktop or laptop or mobile anything is essentially this three stage process you encounter when you think of communication in classical world essentially what you have in mind is you have somebody called sender and somebody called receiver and sender can encode information and send the information through some channel and the receiver can receive it, he or she can decode it. And again, if you want to convey back to the receiver, he or she can encode the information, again, send it back to the channel. And this channel, when I talk about this channel, essentially, it could be face to face, it could be video, it could be telephone, it could be internet, anything you can think of, or email, you know, anything you can think of. And not only that, your channel could be also interrupted by some noise, and you have to take into account the noisy channel scenario also. And before this uh, area of quantum computing emerged you know, uh, in the uh, late 80s, uh, people were thinking that physics and information maybe you know, they are not connected. But it was great insight due to Rolf Landauer who realized that ultimately computation is a physical process, a physical phenomenon happening inside a physical system. Once this realization comes to the mind, you, I mean, you really see a great, uh, uh, you know, different world to view about information science. And that led Lando to propose the so-called information is physical. And in fact, this view, which is often cited as physics of computation, played a very important role in reversible classical computation due to Bennett and others. And that finally led also 
to the field of quantum computing, which I will try to uh, you know highlight somewhat uh, during this talk. And we all will agree that physics is deeply involved in fundamental work, which ultimately leads to various various technological developments. And even cite many examples starting from computers, internet, electronic devices, communication systems, and recently this emerging field or emerging technology, which we call quantum information technology. So how this uh, idea of quantum computing, how does it start? So this started by, you know, if you look back the history, uh, we will realize that uh, uh, it all started with one of our great physicists, Richard Feynman, in 1982. So he realized that if you want to simulate a complex quantum system or complex many body system on a classical computer, that will be very, very inefficient. So why not you exploit quantum system to simulate a quantum system? So that was the first insight, uh, you know, first hint came due to Feynman. And uh, he asked this question, what can happen if you store information in two distinct state of a quantum object. Uh, but he did not go that far. Uh, uh, but nevertheless, that really fueled this, uh, you know, this idea of uh, storing information in quantum state of a quantum physical system. Okay. Uh, but it was really a clever idea to David Doyce in 1985, who realized that if you store information in distant state of quantum system, then we know that quantum systems obey so-called superposition principle. Okay, that means that if you have two distant state like say spin up or spin down, it is also possible for you to have a quantum state which is a linear combination of this up and down state that we all know is allowed if you go to subatomic domain okay or subatomic organs so so that is the key point that was realized by david Doyce, and using this superposition principle he developed the whole you know whole uh, idea of quantum uh, sorry quantum charge during thesis and quantum computing idea and uh, and you can say that david Doyce is really the father of quantum computer so essentially, what, are, what is a quantum computer? If you ask this question, the simplest answer is it is a device that performs computation using principles of quantum physics or quantum theory, the ultimate theory of nature. Okay. So, so for his pioneering contribution, he uh, he was honored uh, fellow of Royal Society, and here is a citation, uh, you know, coming from Royal Society of London in 2008. So David does laid the foundation of quantum theory of computation and has made most of important advances in the field, including discovery of the first quantum algorithm and many more things. Okay. So this is, I mean, this shows that uh, how this idea really changed the, you know, the whole world of computation and you know this whole quantum information technology that we talk now is uh, essentially uh, due to David Doyce. Okay, so there is another motivation. Uh, this is not the, I mean, not the only motivation, but one of the early motivation was coming also uh, from the so-called Morris law. Uh, uh, that is the number of transistors and a chip doubles every 24 months. And this is not a, a law that you know that uh, you can prove this is kind of empirical observation uh, and this has been a guiding principle for high-tech industry since it was coined by intel co-founder gordon moore in 1965. so if you look back uh, history you will see that record ago uh, companies were building chips uh, 500 nanometer and currently uh, over a couple of years people are I mean, industries are trying to build over few nanometer like seven nanometer or even less than that and in future it may be in much smaller scale so this is the kind of uh, picture you might have seen before. So if you go by this trend, by 2030, you will reach a scale where transistors need to be built at about two nanometer, which is exactly, uh, I mean, which is uh, uh, of the order of size of the four atomic distance, you know. 
and we know that at atom atomic scale we have to use uh, you know different uh, physics because conventional classical physics break down and you have to use quantum physics to store and process information and this is uh, you know just a historical uh, uh, remark i thought i should tell you um, so coming back to quantum computing the basic thing that you have to realize is something called quantum bit okay so let us see what is quantum bit so we know that as i said in the beginning a classical bit can exist in zero or one so also you can design a quantum system we can remain in zero or one because you can identify any two distinct state you can think of you know you can think of uh, say hydrogen atom which is ground state and say first excited state so if it is ground state you say it is zero if it is first excited state you say it is one okay or you can think of electron spin if it is spin up state you say it is zero if it is spin down you say it is one okay but in quantum mechanics we know that the physical system can be can remain in superposition of spin up and spin down or you know in superposition of ground and excited state and so on okay so once you have this you see a drastic change in way you visualize information because once you have a state which is alpha up plus beta down if you translate this physical state to a logical state it tells you that your system is in a superposition of zero and one okay so that's what the sentence uh, means i mean uh, meaning of the sentence is that a qubit can remain simultaneously in zero and one the meaning of zero and one is essentially re referring to the fact that you can have a quantum state which is in a superposition of spin up and spin down state because you say up is zero down is one now we have alpha up like beta down or a up like b down with a and b as complex numbers and then this physical state in the language of information becomes a state which is both zero and one okay so that is the new thing that happens when you think of storing information in quantum state so as i just said you can think of quantum uh, a quantum bit uh, in any physical system you can think of electron spin or proton polarization or as i said uh, two atomic energy level and anything you can imagine okay and what is the beautiful thing that happens now is this inherent parallelism because you are able to assess simultaneously both zero and one so you see some kind of parallelism happening here and thus inherent parallelism is responsible for new type of computation which you call quantum computation okay so here is a pictorial way of visualizing this quantum bit so so if you say spin up is zero and spin down is one so this is like classical bit but in quantum mechanics you can have a situation which is alpha up plus beta down where alpha beta complex numbers and this is the state of a quantum bit but when you do a measurement on a quantum state we know that the wave function of the system collapses so you will get either up or down so that will lead to again one classical bit so if you do measurement on a quantum bit like this you will get either up or down state and once you get the result that will again end up having one classical bit. So if you think of a two quantum bit, what happens? So before telling that, let us see what happens in classical uh, world. So two classical bit can remain in four logical state, as all of you know. So it can be zero, zero, or zero, one, or one, zero, or one, one. But if you have two quantum bit, like two spin half particle, like say two electron or two photon, what happens? You can have a spin up, spin up, or spin down, sorry, spin up, spin down, or spin down, spin up, or you can have both spin down, spin down, okay? But then, because of quantum superposition, you can have a state which you can express as a linear combination of all these states that I just told, okay? That means two quantum bit can remain simultaneously in all these four logical states. So that, is, that so you see, the the magic that is happening in quantum world okay so if you think of a n bit classical uh, computer you know that 
those n bits can be in any one of these two to power n possible logical state that is given any given any instant, instant of time you will uh, you will uh, realize that those n bit can be only can remain only in one of those possible logical state but if you think of a n quantum bit you have again so many possible uh, you know logical state but because of superposition you can found in all those exponential number of possible logical states okay so this is this is this is sometimes in literature you find that it's called massive parallelism what i wrote in the below in this uh, in the sentence here okay so for example if you think of 300 number of quantum bit that is roughly 10 to the 90 which is more than the number of atoms in the known universe so you see the Hilbert space of the quantum uh, i mean logical number of logical states is growing exponentially very fast and quantum computers take the advantage of this exponential number of logical state uh, which is often you know uh, called massive parallelism and that leads to the benefit that people are trying to claim uh, you know with quantum computer so what can you do with quantum computer so technological revolution from quantum computers may allow to solve problems that are currently too complex for classical computer or even supercomputers. So initially, when uh, this theory was being developed, uh, uh, there was this famous so-called source algorithm uh, to do this prime filtration, and there is something called a quantum database search due to Gover. And there was uh, initially uh, algorithm that was found by David Deutsch and Josa which uh, is essentially kind of uh, not a very useful uh, algorithm, but it is kind of a um, uh, mathematical uh, exercise just to show that, yes, indeed, quantum computers are really powerful because they showed that there is a certain task, essentially, that decides the nature of some function. If you do that test on a classical computer, that will take exponential number of steps, whereas if you do on a quantum computer, you can do just in one step. So these are the few things that was uh, discovered in early, you know, 90s, and uh, over the last uh, 25 years, uh, there has been uh, several developments. But uh, I mean, not major algorithm has been found. I mean, there are some, uh, but not as famous as source algorithms has been found. Okay, so. something not going down so just wait uh, i'm not able to go down something down okay oh, okay now you're watching yeah so where are you at? Uh, oh, sorry i think that Sir, could you speak a little loud? Yeah. Uh, so, no, I think it went down, but did not uh, display here. So, okay. So, so building a quantum computer uh, is the rest of the 21st century, which is a very difficult and ambitious challenge, because this could uh, this is potential to you know revolutionize future computers that can do impossible calculations and. It could have plethora of useful applications in healthcare, defense, finance, even in chemistry or even material developments, software debugging, aerospace, and even transport. The speed and power of quantum computer lie in the fact that quantum system can remain in multiple quantum states, as I said, and that occur only at quantum level. We need to bring quantum computing to commercial reality and need extraordinary team to put their efforts. So if you see, uh, this global race uh, for quantum computer over the last four or five years. Uh, I've not listed all these uh, developments, but just I will highlight a few, few of the things. So first thing was uh, by IBM in 2016, they initiated to uh, develop a you know commercial available universal quantum computing machine or system with five qubits. And many users actually started using that and they could uh, obtain very interesting regions. In 2017, IBM Q was announced, and that uh, is a prototype commercial processor with 17 number of qubit, with significant improvement over this uh, type qubit quantum computer. 
So at that time, that, that was the most powerful quantum processor. So IBM is uh, really, uh, you know, planning um, in a much better way compared to all other industries. So in uh, this year, I mean, September 2020, they announced a 65 qubit quantum computer. And by next year, they want to have a 127 number of quantum, I mean, qubit quantum computer. And by 2022, they will build around 433 qubit computer. And in next 10 years, uh, or 13 years, they will build probably, uh, you know, thousand or more than thousand number of qubits. And uh, what they want to do is they want to have, you know, this planning to assess, uh, allow access to developers, programmers, and also researchers to implement quantum algorithms and other information processing protocols. And I just, as I said, I just highlighted this IBM uh, development, but there are more than 30 companies already invested, you know, huge amount of money in this uh, quantum computing business, and uh, they're trying to do something. So for example, uh, you might have seen in the news that Google has, uh, last year, they claimed that there is so-called quantum supremacy. So what is quantum supremacy? It is essentially is a claim where you will find that a quantum computer can solve a problem that no classical computer can solve in any feasible amount of time, irrespective of usefulness of the problem that you are trying to solve. And sometimes people claim that they achieve something called quantum advantage. Essentially what they mean is they build a device and they demonstrate that the device or this quantum computer can solve a problem much faster compared to the classical computer. So if they achieve this, they will say that, okay, we achieved quantum advantage, but if they achieve this, they will say they will achieve supremacy. So this Google, the, uh, they built a you know, processor called Sycamore, and uh, that device, they had about four number of qubit, and they could check the run, random number generation in 200 seconds, and they claim that the best supercomputer uh, in the whole world, if they combine together, it may take 10,000 years. So that just to show the supremacy of this device. But nevertheless, this is not a universal computer because this is designed only to uh, only to uh, solve this particular problem, not any other problem. Okay. So, so if you want to really have a quantum computer, it should be universal in the sense that you should be able to implement any problem that you want to do on a quantum computer. Very recently, just last week, I think this Chinese team, uh, they designed a quantum computer using photonic system, which they claim to be 10 billion times faster than the Google's uh, uh, quantum computer. So in their computer, they could do a task which uh, takes 200 seconds. And if they want to do same thing on a classical computer, even the world's faster supercomputer will take approximately 2.5 billion years to carry out the same calculation. So again, this is a clear example of quantum supremacy. OK, so let me try to dive, I mean, dive a little bit uh, towards quantum communication. Um, because quantum technology encompasses not only quantum computing, it has also quantum communication, quantum metrology, quantum you know, sensing, and many, many things it has actually. So, so to appreciate those issues, let us try to uh, understand a little bit about quantum entanglement. I mean, this is by itself is a huge area of research. I mean, I I, I may not be able to fully convey uh, you know this notion of entanglement, but let me try. So what happens is if you deal with two or more number of quantum particles, you will find that quantum system can be in a strange kind of state, which is, which you call an entangled state. Why entangled state? Because if you find two particles in an entangled state, then you will not be able to associate a definite pure quantum state, or you cannot associate a wave function to it, to individual particles. So, I mean, for students, you know, uh, you know that when you deal with a single particle in a a particle in a box or particle in a well or in a harmonic oscillator potential, essentially you have a single particle and that is subjected to some potential and you solve your Schrodinger equation. equation. Okay? So you associate or you describe the particle in some potential 
and then you you solve the Schrodinger equation and obtain the wave function. So wave function is capturing the all physical information about the quantum system, right? So, but if you are dealing with two particles, again you can solve the Schrodinger equation in some potential. I mean, it may be complicated, it may be difficult, it may be too complex, but I mean, suppose you are able to solve and find the wave function for the two particle system. And if the two particle wave function is in an entangled state, then it is not possible for you to write individual wave function for this particle one and particle two. So this, what it means is that the joint system is in a in an entered, I mean, end to end kind of state, you know, completely uh, entangled state, which is in a definite pure state. But once they are in an entangled state, individuality are lost. Essentially, you will not be able to describe the the particle in a pure and pure state, or in, in, in general language, you will not be able to associate it. Wave function. So the, your inability to associate wave function to individual systems tells you that the global state or the joint state or the many particle state is actually an entangled state. So this is a kind of definition. If you if you wish, you can you know you can carry this definition. I mean, if you want to understand deeply, there are technical definitions, definitions, and uh, you know rigorous ways of defining that. But uh, I think for this uh, general students, I think I should not. Uh, Going to double take. So what is happening is that once you have this entangled state, the individual systems are not independent, and they are linked in a strongest possible way, even if they are far apart. What does that mean? It means the following: that suppose you have two particle and you subject these two particle in some potential, okay, which allows these two particle to interact. And the wave function of the two particles are in an entangled state, as I, I told before. But now what you do is you take one particle, you keep one particle in your laboratory and send the other particle to, say, you know, you take it to Bombay or Delhi or maybe you take it to New York or to a different planet. Doesn't matter, okay? So what the remarkable thing that will happen now is if you do something to this particle, which is in your laboratory, because of this entanglement, because in the past, the time of creation, they are in, they are in, they are in an entangled state. Whatever you do to this particle, the other particle which is far apart, that particle will also feel the effect of this uh, this uh, thing that you are doing on a on your particle, which which is in your laboratory. Okay, that's what I said. That they are linked in a stronger possible way, even if they are far apart. And this quantum entanglement is another weirdest feature of quantum world, and that allows us to do amazing tasks which are otherwise impossible. And I will try to highlight some of the things that that has been done over the last thirty years. Uh, so, so quantum entanglement essentially involves entwining two or more number of particles without physical contact. Once they are created, even if they are far apart, they will remain in an entangled state, and that provides an invisible link between two or more particles which can be used for quantum conservation. This is a miraculous thing that you will see uh, in next uh, in next slide. And this was, uh, I mean, now we are using this entanglement, uh, you know, the notion of entanglement, but this is really a very old idea due to Einstein, Podolsky, Rosen in 1935. Uh, and uh, not only Einstein, Podolsky, Rosen, but at the same time, studying it also, you know, in 1935, he also independently, you know, uh, introduced this idea of entanglement for quantum systems. And in 1935, Einstein could realize that they display strong correlation between special like separate particles. And he thought that this can, this is some kind of spooky action happening. And he was really worried about uh, this spooky action because you know, because he was a person who who firmly believed look quality, you know, because he, he's the person who developed the whole theory of relativity. Uh, so, so he believes strongly that what, whatever you do in your laboratory should not have anything to do, you know, uh, with the other particle. Uh, and uh, that, that debate continued uh, till 1990s. 
but now we know that those spooky action, a strange action can be exploited for quantum communication in quantum computation. Okay, so before going to quantum communication, let me try to tell you uh, some, some, some of the interesting features of quantum uh, information. Uh, so unlike classical information, quantum information, they maintain some kind of privacy, okay? So what it means is that if you store information in a quantum state, however hard you try to do or try to manipulate your quantum uh, states, you will never be able to get all the information that is stored in a quantum state. So quantum states or quantum qubits are essentially, they are, they are very shy, you know, they don't, they don't reveal what they contain inside, you see. So that makes quantum information more secure and more private. So one of the things that were discovered by Uters and Jurek was something called no loading theorem. That is, if you store information in quantum state like qubit, you will never be able to make a copy. But this is in sharp contrast to classical information because classical information, you can copy all the time and that's what you do from mobile to laptop, laptop to desktop and so on, right? But if you are storing information in quantum bit, will never be able to make a copy. But having said that, uh, there is a slight caveat to this statement that is the person who has stored the information, only he or she can make a copy. Nobody else in the world, nobody else in the whole universe, not even God can make a copy of this quantum state. Okay? So this is the very, very profound statement about no cloning. And then, then there is something called node deleting, which we found in 2000, that is something called quantum information cannot be deleted. That is, if you store information in quantum state, there is no physical process which you will allow you to delete information from this quantum state. So these two theorems, no cloning and no deleting, if you take together, it implies that quantum information is some kind of, uh, kind of, you know, a kind of quantity because you will never be able to create it, you will never be able to destroy it, okay? So these two things, taken together tells you that quantum information is having a quality of so-called permanence, you know, like classical information, quantum information has a permanence quality. And there is something called no flipping. Uh, this is essentially uh, tells you that if you have a quantum bit, you cannot design a not get because you know, uh, if you're dealing with classical information, you can design a not get. Which will flip zero to one, one to zero. Okay, but if you are dealing with a quantum bit, you cannot design a flip operation. That is what you no know, flipping. And in two thousand seven, we something we proved that something called no hiding, which tells you that if quantum information is lost from one of the system, what happens? Is it really lost? The answer is no. It's not lost. It simply moves to another subsystem of the environment which could be rest of the universe, rest of the system, you know, whatever you can imagine. And this is really uh, connected to conservation of quantum information. So this was also tested in experiment uh, in 2011 uh, by uh, Anil Kumar and one of his student in uh, Indian Institute of Science, Bangalore, using this uh, nuclear magnetic resonance setup. So and very recently we tried to prove something called uh, no masking. That is, typically, you store information in physical system, but can you store information not in physical system, but in some spooky correlation that one Einstein thought was very, very, you know, very weird and very uh, strange feature of quantum mechanics. So we found that if you want to store information only in spooky correlation, then also it's not possible. That is something called no masking. And these results have been implication in quantum information and quantum communication because once you build these protocols, the devices, you should know what are the rules they obey, what are the rules they respect, and so on. This is like you know setting the rule, rules for the game. Once you start your game, you should know what are the rules you should obey, what are the rules you should respect, and so on. So this the results tells you that okay, you can do this, you can do this, but you cannot do so many things. Okay, so this is the kind of philosophy that uh, uh, one should you know take from these uh, results 
Okay, so what is the big goal in quantum information? So one of the main goal in quantum information science is how well we can store, process, and transfer information using principles of quantum mechanics. This is the main goal. And what you like to do is you like to exploit these quantum features, which is your superposition principle or entanglement or non-locality, and you like like to exploit these features to do some practical applications and for doing some emerging tasks which are impossible otherwise okay so let us see what emerging things you can do with quantum communication so when you think of quantum communication essentially you have two person alice and bob and alice is allowed to do whatever is possible remaining within quantum mechanics okay so in quantum mechanics what can you do you can do unitary operation, you can do measurement, you know. Similarly, Bob is also allowed to do unitary or measurement, remaining again within the rules of quantum mechanics. And in addition to that, what they have is they have so-called quantum channel and classical channel. When I say quantum channel, what I have in mind is they, before starting the protocol, any protocol, they say this entangled state. So the entangled state that I told before is being used as a resource, okay? So in addition to this quantum channel, they also have access to classical channel. And as I just said, classical channel could be anything, could be telephone, could be internet, could be face, could be, you know, uh, anything uh, you can think of. So the main essence of quantum communication is sending quantum information according to quantum rules using given quantum and classical resource. Quantum resource is this thing that is shared between Alice and Bob, and classical resource is the classical channel, and quantum rules is the rule that they have to, you know, they have to uh, obey and implement on those particles that they are having in their laboratory. So that is the main idea. Okay, so in quantum communication, you will see many things, starting from quantum teleportation, super dense coding, remote state preparation, quantum secret sharing, quantum cryptography, quantum internet, and many things have happened, but I am not going to highlight everything, or something I will tell you. So let me tell you quantum teleportation. So if you have seen, uh, you know, sci-fi movie or maybe uh, some Hollywood movie like The Fly or uh, that, uh, you know, serials, uh, you will see that, There is a person and he enters a device and switches, you know, some button and he disappears from here and he appears in some other planet. Okay. That's what you see in teleportation. So dictionary meaning of teleportation is destroying an object at one location and recreating the same thing at a distance location. Okay. This is the meaning of teleportation. Now, can you do quantum teleportation of a physical system? Before 1993, before this was discovered, it was thought that maybe not possible. Why? Why is not possible? Because typically, what you imagine in teleportation is that, for example, think of this person who is entering the device. Okay. So, what may constitute a valid teleportation? So, the way to think is the following: that there is this device somehow will scan all the information of this human being, okay? And that that information will be converted to some strings of bits, and that information will be converted to distant planet. And in the distant planet, there will be some raw material, that using the raw material and the classical information, somebody will recreate this object, and the human being will appear there, okay? This is one of the way, there could be many ways, but this is one of the way that you can think of that what it may mean to do a teleportation. So if you carry this idea to quantum domain, will it work? The answer is no. Why? Suppose somebody comes and gives a quantum state psi. Will you be able to scan this quantum state and know all the information? The answer is no, because you are given just a single quantum state. Scanning a physical system means doing a measurement. Doing a measurement means you will, dest you will destroy the state, OK? So when you want to obtain information about this quantum state, you will fail miserably by doing the measure, measurement, okay? Because measurement will destroy the quantum state. So apparently, you will feel that there is no way to do quantum teleportation using your 
you know, simplistic idea. But surprisingly, Charles Bennett and others, they discovered in 1993 that if you have these entangled states shared between Ellis and Bob, then you don't have to scan all the information. Even without knowing what is the state size, by doing suitable measurement on this, uh, uh, on this particle and this particle, okay, which does not depend on the state size, and conveying that measurement outcome over the class channel, Bob will be able to get back the state sign. Okay, so this is the I'm not going again into detail of this uh, teleportation, you know, equation and so on. But essentially, I am telling you, you know, uh, a very simplistic way of understanding this uh, process. So essentially, this quantum entanglement that is shared between Ellis and Bob, and this measurement that is done between this particle and this particle helps Ellis to recreate the state psi at a distance location. So this is a magical application of quantum entanglement. If somebody is interested, of course, you know, you can read uh, the original paper. This is not very difficult. I mean, uh, you know, any, any graduate student actually can understand. I mean, this equation for teleportation, this is the most amazing, most wonderful, most uh, beautiful uh, discovery in quantum information. But the equation that describes this teleportation is the most simplest equation, just one line equation will tell you everything. If you look at the original paper, the equation is really simple. It, I'm not telling here, but uh, you know, because uh, uh, because there are uh, diverse audience, I'm not telling the main equation here, but, but um, what I'm trying to tell you, those who are interested, they can look back the original paper and I'm, I'm sure they will follow it. Okay, because this is one of the most simplest equation in physics. Okay, so, so here is the first demonstration of quantum teleportation. Uh, it was done by Innsbruck group in uh, 1997. So this is the group that you see here who did the experiment. And this group is uh, the sir. I think he. Uh, sir, there is some uh, problem. Some problem like... is there. Yeah, yeah, hello. Can you just call? Yeah. Does not have incoming service, which will become active after recharge. Thank you. Aapke dwara. Sibir sir, can you call? Actually, uh, it's not connecting from my mobile. Uh, yeah, I, I think by mistake some switch was clicked. I think that is why he exited. Exi yeah. Uh, I will also try to contact. Him. Yes, yes.
Hello. Ah uh, yes, sir. We can hear you. Yeah, I think this went off. So let me try again to connect. That's okay. So how much time do we have? Ah, uh, we have uh, still uh, maybe ten minutes. Ten minutes. Okay. So maybe then I will skip this one. So can you see now? Yeah, yeah, we can see. Ah. Uh, Okay, so maybe I don't know. Okay, let me see how, how how far I can go. Okay, so coming to super dense coding, did you did you hear this or did I did I stop somewhere here or did you did you hear this slide? We Hello? can hear. Now should I start from here or I start from here? I mean, you know better that uh, where to start. Uh, You were in, I think, in the teleportation, right? Alice and Bob. Oh. Oh. Did you did you see this slide? Yes. This one. This one. Yes. This one also you saw. No, 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 no. I think just before previous slide uh, from the uh -huh. previous slide. Okay. Uh, we didn't. See. Yeah, this one. Oh, okay. Okay. Okay, so you're telling that uh, you know how over the last uh, 20 years uh, several scientists have actually you know um, have demonstrated quantum teleportation over long distance, starting from few meter across lab distance to they have gone like over two kilometer distance. Then this Japanese group, sorry Chinese group, they demonstrated teleportation over 16 kilometer in 2010. Then Japanese group they did over 100 kilometer in 2015. uh and very recently uh, last last year i think this chinese group they demonstrated over uh, you know 1400 km using you know uh, ground observatory to low earth orbit satellite and they could also quantify the quantum teleportation uh using so called fidelity so if it is fidelity be one then it is very very I mean, this is ideal but they could receive up to 0.8 so coming to super dense coding this is another protocol where uh, what you do is you want to Convert two classical bit by sending one qubit. Okay, because Sorry, you are not audible. Just could you speak a little loud? You can't hear. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. Now it's okay. Oh no 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 no. Uh, I think it's a mute. I don't know. Can you hear now? Yeah yeah. You can hear, but I think the voice is little low. Uh mm huh. -hmm. Uh. Can you can you see my slide? Yes, yes. Okay. Yeah. So if my voice is low, maybe I should use this earphone. Uh, yes. Hello. Is it? It's much is it better. better now? Okay. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay. So so now I I will tell you something about super dense coding. So typically. If you send a single quantum bit, uh, you know you will be able to get only one classical bit because two. Uh, I mean, uh, if you do a measurement on a quantum bit, you will get two possible outcome, and log base two times two number of outcome is essentially one. So that is why you will get only one classical bit. But what these people Bennett and Wagner they try to show is that if you have already shared entanglement between Alice and Bob, then by sending one qubit, you can double the capacity of the channel. That is. by sending one qubit you can send two classical bit that is why this is called super dense coding okay so what this trying to tell you that entanglement not only helps you to do quantum communication but also it can have it can help in doing classical communication okay the scenario is something like this so so we have alice and bob and alice wants to send two classical bit so beforehand before starting protocol they have this entangled state shared between alice and bob and two classical bits comes in any form they they want to have uh, you know encoding procedure so so it could be 00011011 and depending on this two classical bit elish does some encoding and sends qubit to bob and bob will be able to do measurement and distinguish all those four possible state and he can get two classical bit that is the main idea and uh, there is something called remote state preparation which uh, was proposed uh, Uh, in 2000 uh, so the idea here is the following that unlike quantum teleportation where somebody comes and gives a state to 
we recreated at a distant location. Here, what is to be done is Alice wants to prepare a state which is known to her. That is, she has something in her mind, and she wants to uh, prepare the quantum state at a distant location, a distant laboratory, without physically sending it. So it is like this. So I will give you an analogy. So suppose you are in your kitchen and you want to, uh, you know, you want to, uh, you want to prepare a dish and send it to your friend's uh, house. Okay. So what can you do? You can either prepare your, your, you know, your dish at your home and send it by courier to your friend's place, or you can make a telephone call and tell all the recipe to your friend. Your friend can prepare in in his kitchen. Okay. So it is exactly like that. So preparing a quantum state. At a distance location without physically sending the quantum state. So of course, Alice can prepare the quantum state and send by some channel. But uh, the amazing thing that, that happens here is, if Alice and Bob they share this entangled state without physically sending the quantum bit, just by sending one classical bit, Alice can prepare a certain kind of quantum state at a distance location. That's why that's why I call this a remote state preparation. And this was also tested by many groups here, you know, by different experiments. Okay, so the idea is very simple here. So you have this Alice and Bob, and they share this entangled state, and Alice has a quantum state in her mind. Okay, she will do something on this entangled half of the entangled particle and send the measurement outcome, and Bob will do something, and the state that Alice wanted to prepare in his or her laboratory will be prepared here. Okay. So again, this is miraculous application of quantum entanglement. Without this entanglement, this is not possible. So coming to secret sharing, uh, this is very old. I mean, even classical context, this is well known. So what they want to do is you have two people, Alice and Bob, and they want to have a joint account. So neither of them can have access to the account alone, but together they can have. Okay, they can withdraw some money. So what do you want? You want a secret password to use the account. Neither Alice nor Bob alone has this password. So, for example, Alice has a string of random number. Bob has a bitwise addition of that key. So, this is your key, and this is your, what actually Alice has this string. Bob has this string. Okay. So, if you look at this string or this string, you don't see this key. But if you add this two bitwise, that is addition modulo two, because one plus one is two, but that is zero. Zero plus one is one. You see one here. And one plus zero is one, so we see one here, and so on. Okay, so bitwise addition modulo two. If you do, you will get the key. Okay, so this is a simpler scenario where neither Alice nor Bob has a, any information about the key, but they come together. They can use the code and they can get the money. Okay, so this idea has been generalized to quantum domain using uh, you know multi-particle entangled states and quantum different kind of quantum states, and this allows to share secret among many. Uh, three or more number of uh, parties, so that any one of them, any two of them, cannot. Uh, I mean, individually they cannot, but if they come together, they can reconstruct the secret. But any single person cannot, as I said. So coming to crypto cryptography is this again, you know, uh, very old idea in the context of classical information. So this is art of encrypting and decrypting message in codes in order to ensure their authenticity and confidentiality. The fundamental task here is to allow two users to have secret communication unintelligible to any third party. So typically you have the plain text, you encrypt it using some key and you send the cipher text and Bob, Bob has the key and he can decrypt and get the, get the plain text. So, uh, so in classical context, data encrypted and decrypted with the same key. Uh, you can have many examples starting from Caesar cipher and one time paired and so on. So first idea in quantum domain was proposed by again Bennett and Brassard in 1984. This is the starting year of so-called quantum cryptography. So they again, they have two person, Alice and Bob, and they have the quantum channel and they can use certain, they can encode the information in certain basis and they can do random measurement and they can discuss over classical channel. And again, Bob will do some random measurement and do the public communication and in the end they will share some key which they can again use for their secret communication so there is a proposal to do quantum internet also because what can you do is you can 
have quantum information encoded process and stored locally in quantum node and the nodes are connected by quantum channel when i say quantum channel it could be quantum teleportation channel or remote state preparation channel or anything you can think of and that you can transport qubit from one side to other side and you can distribute entanglement over entire network and that will lead to quantum internet so in future you can download entanglement you could download qubit and you can consume it for your computation or even communication so typically this may look like this you have some quantum node and here you store information and then you could teleport or you can uh, do rsp and you can con connect all the nodes so quantum technology is a very uh, futuristic goal and it has far reaching innovation based on fundamental laws of physics and laws of nature and the main goal here is this will make devices smaller faster and much more powerful than the present day devices this could comprise quantum computer quantum software quantum information system quantum communication scheme like quantum teleportation or remote state preparation or quantum internet and not only limited to this but it could also have improved precision of atomic clock quantum algorithm for tackling hard problems or uh, even earth to space quantum key distribution and this will change nearly every aspect of future life so just to uh, so this slide for students and who may be interested in this uh, area in future so this is not just a domain of physics this is actually highly interdisciplinary science so this field has input from quantum theory from computer science from engineering from information theory from communication cryptography and now actually many more areas are actually evolving you know uh, so this is really highly interdisciplinary science so and not that you if you are just a physicist you can do you can enter in this area you can you know you can you can come from any any field and you can try to do something in this direction okay so, so i think i am almost uh, close to yeah so almost done now uh, so i will just try to summarize what i said so quantum mechanics allows a new way of storing and processing information uh, and that tells you that quantum information is fundamentally different than classical information because it exposed the principle of linear superposition and quantum entanglement which you don't see in the classical world and quantum computers can perform certain computational tasks much more faster than their classical counterpart and over last five years you you see all over you know in your newspaper or news articles and uh, you know various places there is a global race to build quantum computer also i try to convey uh, some interesting features about quantum information because qubits they maintain the privacy because you cannot make a copy of qubit you cannot delete you cannot flip you cannot mask and so on so all these uh, features tells you that quantum information is secure at a more fundamental level and not only that quantum information allows a new ways of making communication which are impossible in classical world and in this context i tried to highlight a uh, few protocols starting from quantum teleportation to super dense coding remote state preparation quantum secret sharing quantum cryptography quantum internet and many more things are happening today quantum communication can allow a complete secure way of transferring information quantum teleportation is an important protocol that will one day make quantum communication over long distance possible already we have seen this and entanglement is very crucial in this context and that provides the invisible wiring between distant nodes in quantum communication so one of the biggest challenge is to build to produce to maintain entanglement over long distance one of the uh, you know uh, great challenges in addition to building quantum computer this is another challenge okay so the next revolution will be quantum computing quantum communication and quantum information technology there is no doubt about this okay so here is the last slide so today's basic science is tomorrow's technology so stay motivated and do something for the future okay so thanks for your attention thank you sir uh, so now the session is open for discussion uh, so questions please
if any of you have questions please unmute your mic and directly interact with the speaker hi sir hi uh, excellent talk sir i was very much interested in hearing your talk so you were talking about that google uh, mm -hmm. uh, they have made that uh, so solution using qubit yeah, yeah. and then chinese had better it like that yeah. it was okay. can mm -hmm. you throw a little bit light on what was the nature of uh, yeah so yeah. yeah so what what google did last year was uh, they tried to uh, uh, try to claim that they could verify a true random number generation using their device okay because verifying a random number in a classical computer is almost impossible because in classical computer there is no true random random number okay Whereas quantum system are inherently random because when you do a measurement on a quantum system, when you get outcome zero or one, you don't know a priori whether you are going to get zero or one. Okay, because because of the inherent indeterminism that is associated with uh, quantum uh, systems, these outcomes are that you are getting it truly random. Okay, so when you do a measurement, you may get zero, you may get one. Next time you may get zero. Next time also you may get zero. Next time you may get one, and so on. Okay, that this true randomness actually is inherent to quantum systems, and that's what they exploit and they claim that they could verify a generation of a random number in in 200 seconds, and uh, and to do that with the classical supercomputer it may take uh, you know a thousand years or so. That was the claim of Google. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Uh, yes. Madam, in chat box, there is a question, madam. Yes. yes. Uh, so actually, yeah, one question is, uh, what is actually meant by quantum apocalypse? Quantum? What? Apocalypse. Sir, you can see in the chat box also. Mm -hmm. Where is the chat box? Uh... I don't see because usually I use Zoom. Uh, yes. uh, so the next question is if one zero and zero one mm -hmm. represents spin up, spin mm -hmm. down, and spin down, spin up respectively, mm -hmm. then how mm -hmm. can we distinguish between zero, one zero, and zero one? Yeah, because they are mutually orthogonal. Okay. So zero one and one zero, they are mutually orthogonal state. And in and in quantum systems, if they are in any one of the orthogonal state, you can distinguish because you can do a suitable project to measurement and you can distinguish okay so <clears throat> as long as quantum systems are in orthogonal state they are like classical states okay because classically when you have a distinct state you can always do a measurement and distinguish those classical states right classically all these states are distinguishable okay that is the hallmark of classical system but in quantum system there are orthogonal states there are non orthogonal states if you prepare a system in non orthogonal state then of course you can distinguish because there will be finite overlap between two states that will lead to you know uh, lead to failure okay but as long as they are in orthogonal state you can perfectly distinguish Mamta, can i ask one question yeah yeah yeah, yeah professor pati hi this is dr sarangi i'm from iit palakkad so uh, i have some very uh, naive question i mean it may be i mean i'm not an expert in this field neither i know much about it but some naive inquiry about uh, whatever uh, did, did I listen. So what are the sources of noise in this kind of communication tunnels? I mean, like uh, in classical analog of uh, in, in the quantum communications, you will have some noise and the world. How are the noise play a role? I mean, how does yeah, the noise? Yeah, yeah. And uh, the, yeah, second yeah, problem, I mean, yeah. the second probably uh, on again, uh, the mode of communications, because for example, yeah. if you are propagating the uh, quantum, quantum bits in some mm -hmm. channel, probably you'll be using some kind of a let's say photonic uh, polar, photon polarization or some optical mm -hmm. channel to yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. are they also prone to all these classical problems of like coherence and uh, you know loss uh, or yeah, like yeah, yeah, yeah 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 everything yeah so, so, so how do so you in addition, on that in addition to whatever noise you may encounter in classical communication you will uh, all those you will encounter and in addition to that you may encounter quantum noise like suppose you are sending a spin up state through your say through quantum channel okay for the timing imagine that you are sending 
photon polarization in horizontal polarization state through say some optical fiber okay so on the way it might get flipped to say vertical polarization so this is called bit flip okay so the, this kind of noise may happen it can happen bit flip or phase flip or both or it may be amplitude damping you know many kind of different noise will uh, you know can act on the quantum system and there are ways to model the noise uh, using so called uh, uh, you know quantum operator formalism quantum uh, noise uh, noise model and so on so and there are ways to also correct the errors noise uh, that act on the system so all the things are possible and actually people are taking care of those yes so, so you are right. I mean, all the things will happen, and you have to, you know, you have to be very careful, and you have to have a way to handle those errors and those noise. You know, in the end, because you want ideal communication, and if there is some noise, your fidelity may not be as good as you want it to be. You know, so you have to be careful about that. Yes, yeah. So uh, the relevant question is that if, you, if the uh, the bit flip happens in the intermediate state mm -hmm. and. Hmm. There is a way to distinguish that there is a big flip happened. I mean, are the receiving one? I mean, is there a yeah, way? Yeah, to... yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah, they can distinguish. And uh, yeah. the second bit, what I asked for, I mean, I'm just going on. So, this uh, about this pro propagation. So, are they also prone to this classical losses of coherence and all? Will they impact? Those, uh, ah, 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 ah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Mm. Professor Bhatti Aravinda here, actually. Ah, I just, ah. I, I'm, I'm so ah. happy to listen to you. I have some another thank nice you. question. Thank you, thank you. Uh, what happens to what happens to the uh, current ways of uh, memory? Uh, mm -hmm. How do we how do we, uh, we 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 address the requirements of uh, saving and memory once we come to in, come to this kind of computations? Mm -hmm. Yeah, memory. I mean, you will not be able to uh, uh, you know. I mean, what are saving? Mm, you will not be because because you see, finally, even if you. Even if you are having exponential number of logical states assisting at the same time, when you want to extract the information, you are extract only n bit. You see, so so storing and extracting are not really uh, enhanced. It is it is only the processing that uh, gets enhanced due to this so-called superposition and uh, this uh, this parallelism that is uh, that is there that offers extra advantage only when you process information. You see, so. So our current limitations yeah. of this cloud and our current limitations of the hardware still remains to be addressed. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. yeah, yeah. Mm. Okay. Mm. But having said that, uh, there are ways to. Uh, I mean, there are uh, different uh, protocols where they claim that if you use uh, um, entangle uh, uh, light, you can read your memory much faster compared to what you would be doing. Uh, with the classical laser light, so there are some claims about that. So, so it's maybe maybe you will not be able to enhance the storing and the storing capacity, but maybe you will be able to enhance your uh, reading capacity. So there is a there is a paper about that. So, so you appreciate my question was basically coming from my own field. Yeah, 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 yeah. Where where data processing is equally important, but data saving is equally mm. important for us because uh, mm. uh, we 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 know that in this particular case, what you are saying is that you can't copy, you can't. Uh, mm. Mm. Uh, is those are definitely very advantageous things, but mm. the sheer volume of the data we handle, for mm. example, the genomics uh, area. Mm -hmm. Even quantum computing will help us uh, process things much faster. How do we address this? Uh, uh, you know this uh, this, this present uh, limitations. That's what made me ask that question. Mm -hmm. anyway, yeah, I, I, I have a long way to go for that. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I think uh, there is one more question from Jeff Sim. Uh, if measurements are made on one zero and zero one states. Do the measurements itself alter the quantum state? Yeah, yeah. I mean, if your quantum state is in an arbitrary state, okay. So, so forget about zero, 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 one, all the two qubit state. Think of a simple uh, single qubit state, okay. So, if your single qubit is in state zero or one, and if you do a measurement in zero one basis, there is no disturbance. You will not disturb the state because that is already in eigenstate, right? Your 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 textbook level, you know that you know. Uh, your familiar tells you that if you the system is already in one of the eigenstate and you do a measurement, you will not disturb the state, right? But suppose your system is in a 
superposition of 0 and 1, like alpha 0 plus beta 1. In that state, if you do measurement and 0 1 basis, then you will disturb the state, OK? Because your state was originally alpha 0 plus beta 1. Once you do a measurement, you will be either in 0 or 1, OK? You lose alpha and beta, right? So that is the key point. Okay, is so it, is it clear? Yeah, is it clear, JFC? If not, then uh, could you please unmute your mic and you can speak? Is it clear what I said? Hello? Yes, I think so. he cannot speak, maybe. So he is saying that it's clear. Okay. Okay. Uh -huh. Is there any more question? Uh, I would like to ask one question. Mm -hmm. uh, what is the cost effectiveness of a um, quantum computer uh, compared to the classical computer? If you, because for most of the users, you do not require that kind of a speed or a storage, um, mm -hmm. except in special cases of research and global models and all that. For a home computer, uh, even if you give a very high speed and all, you know, infinite memory, it, it is not going to be needed. But uh, yeah. it is the cost that is most important uh, for a widespread use of the quantum computer. Will it ever replace the classical computer at the home? No, 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 no. I don't think this will ever replace classical computer. So, so what will happen is, I mean. Uh, even if uh, you know somebody, some companies build a thousand qubit quantum computer, which will, which is universal, still classical computer will be you know side by side because you have to build an interface between quantum computer, classical computer, and they have to be in conjunction with these two. And uh, I think you will not uh, totally get rid of classical computer. Okay, so I mean, I mean, uh, the, the the key point is whatever you can do on a classical computer. All those things you can do quantum computer, but then why you will do that by paying huge price, right? So you you will as you said rightly, you will use quantum computer only for doing something which is not possible on a classical computer. So so you know you have to identify what are the difficult, challenging problems that you would like to do on a quantum computer. Okay. Oh, all yeah. right. Uh, if you if I use uh, you know, the supercomputers. I think there still um, there is a need for you know greater speed and uh, uh, storage and all that and some of these uh, supercomputers use the weather modeling and all that. Mm -hmm. uh, where will it be again a cost effective compared to a present supercomputer? I mean the fastest that, in the world. That is not very um, clear. I mean, that we cannot say at this stage. I mean I, I have no idea honestly. So. I mean, nobody probably will be able to tell that uh, and what will be cost uh, really, you know, uh, once we have a full-fledged quantum computer. But, uh, but yeah, I mean, the way, uh, you know, industries and companies are really making progress, maybe they will make it cost-effective. That I am I am slightly hopeful, but uh, you never know. So, well, yeah. Because this parallel computing can also mm -hmm. Keep mm. on expanding the classical computers, mm. and uh, perhaps the speed and uh, and, mm. and the storage keep on increasing even with oh. the present uh, bipolar technology also. Uh, mm -hmm. So, will it ever reach? I mean, the quantum, uh, as you have uh, explained, the quantum computers have a in that in that one. So the cost thing will uh, will not be clear now. What no. about the operating? Operating no. systems. No, no, no. You will never, never. I mean, what, whatever supercomputers you will build uh, now or in future, they will never be able to reach the efficiency or speed up compared to what a quantum computer could achieve. Okay, because they are dramatically different uh, processes, right? So in one, in one, in quantum computer, you are exploiting so-called quantum parallelism, quantum superposition, quantum entanglement, whereas in supercomputer, all these processing units are essentially classical. Okay, so, so however faster, however efficient you can make a supercomputer, they will never be able to match a quantum computer. Okay, so that, that, that we know. I mean, yeah. I mean uh, now uh, the classical computers were made so friendly using these various kind of operating systems. Uh, so, uh, 
Will the same operating systems uh, will work with the quantum computers also? Not not all. I mean, still in, again. I mean, still we don't know which physical system, which uh, you know, kind of uh, material, which kind of uh, uh, logic gear. You know, is really scalable or really going to take the commercial uh, scale. We don't know that. So still, I'm very early to say something on that. No. Mm. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, so is there any other question? Uh, if not, this, this is the final question. Uh, maybe it's not a question, sir. Just I repeat uh, what you mentioned already, maybe. So this is what uh, you talked about, the no hiding theorem or no mm -hmm. realism theorem. Is it like mm -hmm. the information uh, that is you said already that it cannot be created or destroyed? Mm -hmm. So, uh, But this uh, no deletion, uh, you mean that it's not permanently deleted? Yeah, it, is, it remains. If you delete from your system, it simply goes and remains, you know, in some part of the machine or some part of the universe. Or, you know, it remains in some corner, OK? so. So you never able, able to really delete it, yeah. yeah. OK, so this is, I think, this no deletion. Mm -hmm. mm. Yes. I can't hear, huh? Yeah, yeah, we can hear. Uh, you're saying something? Oh, OK, 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 OK. Oh, yeah, I got your point, yes. Mm -hmm. OK. OK. Uh, Okay, so I think that are no more questions. So, thank you, sir, for the very interesting and insightful talk. I think you uh, very nicely we explain how the future generation will be totally in the quantum world. So we will be uh, forgetting about the classical uh, future. So I'm sure all of our colleagues and also senior professors of our uh, department who are already there and uh, they have interacted with the speaker. Mm, so, uh, I mean, uh, uh, it was very nice. We enjoyed the talk. And I think, uh, I hope our students also must have enjoyed the talk. But, sir, we are looking forward to have you in Kerala University once the corona sure, is gone. Sure, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, I will yeah, request yeah. uh, our head, Dr. CV, just to give the final uh, means. Uh, Finally, just thank you. Thank you, sir. Bye. I have a request on behalf of the department to visit someday over yeah. here. Sure, sure. When yeah. you come over here, it will mm -hmm. be nice. And uh, we are mm -hmm. having a uh, one year long program celebrating mm -hmm. this Golden Jubilee year. And mm -hmm. our uh, former head, Dan uh, Ramarao sir, is also there. Mm -hmm. And tomorrow we are flying off the events. Mm -hmm. So, anyway, uh, if uh, everything settles down and uh, probably we can travel, then I also take this opportunity on behalf of mm -hmm. all the faculty yeah. members. I invite you personally to come over here when you mm -hmm. get time. And mm -hmm. I thank you from bottom of my heart. Thank, thank you so for, much. Yeah. For mm -hmm. meeting you and also uh, it was such a nice thing to talk to you uh, in the phone also uh, as well as hearing your lecture. It was fantastic, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you sir. Thank you. Okay. Take care and stay safe. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Stay safe, safe. Time for you. Take care, yeah. Rao, sir, thank you. Rao, sir. Thanks, everyone. Yeah. All right. <laughs> thank you very much. Sir, see you uh, tomorrow. Nice, see you tomorrow. It was a nice talk, and yeah, we will see you again tomorrow. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Mm -hmm.